Today I am joined by Evan McMullen, who, if you don't know, this time last year we were in the midst of a very intense presidential candidate race between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, but Evan McMullen also decided to throw his hat in the race as an independent third party candidate. So I do have a few questions to ask you about your organization mm -hmm. that you started last summer mm -hmm. called sure. Stand Up Republic. Yeah. So if you don't mind kind of explaining a little bit about mm -hmm. the organization and of course why you decided mm -hmm. to run. Yeah, well, I decided to run and, and with Mindy Finn, who was my running mate and the t all the, the team that was involved because we felt it important that especially from the, the right side of the traditional American political spectrum, there be a candidate in the, in the general election that was standing for equality and liberty in the United States. Uh, we were concerned about the options uh, Americans were being given and especially concerned about uh, Donald Trump's candidacy, which we, we thought was dangerous for the country. And, and so we got in as a result of that. Now, we knew that that was the beginning. We knew we had very little chance of winning, um, but that after the election, it would be important to still stand for those issues and to build a political network or movement in order to protect liberty and equality in America and, and uh, as a part of that, our democracy. So after the election, we started Stand Up Republic, and, and that is a, a nonprofit that's focused on defending democracy in the United States. It's an organization that people on the right and the left can support and be a part of. We're, we're only focused on defending democracy, not on the typical partisan issues. Our, our goal is to ensure that, uh, that democracy and its defense does not become a partisan issue. It's at risk of becoming so. Uh, and then also uh, helping Americans understand that in the, in the work of defending our democracy, we actually do have some common ground, at least on that, that issue. And we think that's a starting place for developing you know, and, and finding additional common ground and ways forward in our country. And when you say you know, you're hoping that dem democracy doesn't become a partisan issue, yeah. what do you kind of mean by that? Do you have any mm -hmm. examples? And what are you guys doing actively now to mm -hmm. ensure that doesn't happen? Yeah, there are a couple of things. For example, uh, you know, Russia's interference in the, this last election, that's a, a real thing. It happened, and it was a, a multifaceted, sophisticated effort to manipulate the way we think and the way we think about each other and uh, and and it is something that we we simply cannot allow to happen on that scale certain countries will always try to meddle in our politics but on that scale it's we simply cannot allow it and we need to be wise to it in order to prevent it uh, the the problem is that that has become a bit of a partisan issue where you have some Republicans saying it didn't happen, some people on the left saying it, it was everything and it's the only thing that matters. Um, you know, the truth is it, it is something that happened. It does matter a lot, not only for the past election, uh, you know, Mueller and the other law enforcement people will, will sort all that out, but for our future, we have to make sure that our ability to choose our own leaders is something that, again, is not partisan. It's something that we all defend the process. It's like, you know, and two baseball teams play each other. They may be bitter rivals, but they agree on the rules. And there are other, there are other issues like that, Jerry, gerrymandering. The Supreme Court just heard an important case on gerrymandering today. Uh, we'll see where, where that goes, but, but there, there are partisan sort of layers on, on that issue as well, and it simply cannot be. And kind of going off of democracy and following mm -hmm. the rules, on mm -hmm. Sunday night, obviously, we saw one of the deadliest mass shootings in American history. And of course, our thoughts and prayers are going <coughs> out to all of the victims, their families, and anyone affected by that tragedy. But in terms mm -hmm. of gun control and Second mm -hmm. Amendment, of course, this is a topic that has resurfaced and people feel very, very strongly about. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of defending democracy, making sure mm -hmm. it doesn't become a partisan issue, mm -hmm. where do you stand on you know, gun control or licensing mm -hmm. and looking into, do we need more rules? Do we need mm -hmm. more checks? Do we not? We um, you know, yeah. Stand on that. Well, I'll say, of course, it's a it's a very critical issue now for our country and has been. But it's, you know, it's it's heartbreaking to see what we've seen and unfathomable, really. It's, you know, we've had terrible attacks in the United States before, really horrendous attacks. Um, as somebody who has served time in war zones, you know, I heard I've heard those sounds that that we heard in Vegas, that sort of that machine gun or machine gun like fire, that rapid fire. I've, I've heard that only in war zones and I never expected to see it here in the United States. And it's just such a tragic, 
tragic thing because I know, and the country is learning if, if for those who haven't experienced war before, just how devastating that kind of weaponry can be. Uh, so look, I, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment. I'm a gun owner myself. I do believe we need uh, common sense reforms. Uh, for example, and we're still learning what kind of weapons he had and how he was able to make them, if they weren't fully automatic, make them fire like they were fully automatic. Uh, I think we've, we, we've got to make some reforms there so that kind of weaponry just isn't, isn't available. We need you know, expanded background checks. Um, but, you know, I, I personally don't see how you, one can make the argument that, that, that we need in this country fully automatic weapons among the citizenry or any modifications that allow them to become fully automatic. And I think that's probably what I'm reading and hearing initially is that he used some um, equipment to, to modify the, the performance of his weapons to turn them into essentially auto automatic weapons. And, uh, and, and you, we see how devastating they are. And, and we just, I, I think we, 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 can't, we can't have that. And for those of you watching and tuning in, a little bit of a background on Evan. So you spent a fair amount of time in the CIA mm -hmm. doing counter- 11 years, yeah. 11 years uh, mm -hmm. doing counterterrorism mm -hmm. and intelligence work in mm -hmm. the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And then I know you spent some time in the private sector mm -hmm. and then were in Washington with the um, House Republican Committee, yep. which was chaired by Congressman Kathy McMorris Rogers. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. you were the policy officer mm -hmm. alongside her, so yeah. crafting that. And then you decided mm -hmm. to kind of get into this race and mm -hmm. where do you see yourself kind of taking the next steps? Do you, mm -hmm. you know, see public office in your future or would you encourage young people that are here at the summit to, you know, if they feel strongly about an issue to get into the arena themselves? Yeah, I, I would, I would recommend it. I mean, it's such a personal uh, decision that it, it's, you know, hard to push anyone too hard towards running themselves. But I would say that uh, if people have an interest, they should explore it. But even more importantly than, than that, because not everyone's going to want to do that or feel like it's right for them, but just be engaged however you, however you can. Certainly vote, um, but also in between elections, be very engaged. Make sure you're very well informed. Read, read things from different sources on you know, both sides of issues so that you can sort of triangulate around what you think and what the core facts are. And then make sure you're very much engaged with, engaged with your local and, and federal level uh, elected leaders. But just you know, be engaged. I mean, that's the critical thing in any way, however you choose to do it, whether you run for office, whether you volunteer on a campaign, whether you write letters or make phone calls or are active in social media, it's also critical. Um, as far as me, what I'll do, I, I do believe that I will pursue public office again. I don't know when I'll do that. That is the honest to goodness truth. You know, I'm looking at some things now that's true, um, some pot potential races. Um, but, you know, I, I do think I'll run again. I'm just not sure when the right time is. I'm, I'm most focused on um, helping the country get through some immediate challenges. And I want to do that however best I can while also sort of managing my own personal life and, and all of that. So, Well, going back to Stand Up Republic, the yeah. organization, nonprofit, um, mm -hmm. I was reading some tweets that Stand Up mm -hmm. had put out recently. And last mm -hmm. week you were saying that um, kind of following the Alabama Senate race that's yeah. going on, you were saying it's time for the GOP to embrace inclusion, to embrace tech, and to embrace mm -hmm. economic freedom, which is mm -hmm. certainly topics that we've been covering this week at the summit. Mm -hmm. And so when you say tech, to embrace mm -hmm. that or to embrace economic freedom, I mean, we have so many young entrepreneurs here. Mm -hmm. What is the message that you want to send to the GOP? What do you mm -hmm. think that they need to do to innovate? Yeah, well, I think there, there are so many deep issues, so many things, that, so many things that, that the GOP needs to do. But we need to ensure that we have an economy that, uh, that inspires and that incentivizes innovation. That's, that's a, critical, a critical thing. You know, my concern with where the, the party has gone over the last you know, decade and a half, two decades, is that it's become a, a party for you know, incumbent business interests and not for new ideas, not for you know, new technologies. And, and I believe that has to change. We, we need a vibrant economy that is very competitive, that competitive, that, that competitive nature, the competitive nature of, of a vibrant economy uh, inspires innovation. Uh, and innovation is critical to everything from our healthcare system to our national defense, to our just, just the, you know, the, the, the bare elements of our economy in general, our jobs, et cetera. 
Um, so I, I would like to see a Republican Party that was sort of recommitted to free enterprise and a, a competitive economy in the United States where you know, major interests aren't sort of getting their work done in D.C. Uh, in a way that stifles competition. And while I worked on the Hill, I saw some of that. I saw very big, powerful interests come to the Hill, well capitalized to, you know, lobby and, and drive, you know, changes in policies that benefited them. And in some cases, froze out, you know, smaller uh, insurgent players in, in a number of industries. And so, uh, I think you know that's one of the, m the many things that that the Republican Party needs to do. And also going off of what happened last mm -hmm. week, we saw that President Trump and the Republicans laid out a new tax plan. Mm -hmm. And so looking at that tax plan, and again going off of some so many of the young you know small business owners that have come to the summit or young entrepreneurs that are here who mm -hmm. are trying to make it in China, mm -hmm. hope for that successful business. How do you think that tax plan will help them? I mean coming in from a kind of bipartisan perspective, mm -hmm. do you think that you know tax reimbursements or tax breaks will ultimately mm -hmm. be successful for them and that plan is going to help? Yeah, well, I, I will say, and I, I won't argue that it's completely unrelated because uh, you, you know, there's a huge problem in the United States with, with, in the United States with income inequality, and that's only going to get uh, more serious, I think, with automation and, and other technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera. Um, but you know, we at Senate Republic aren't aren't so focused on issues that are of more of a traditionally partisan nature, like tax reform. And it certainly, as candidates, we were. I, I will say that. Look, I, I favor you know fiscal responsibility. Um, I I hope that this tax plan um, does not add to our national debt. Um, I don't want to. I, I don't favor gimmicks that say, okay, in 10 years we're going to save money, because the reality is every year it's a new plan and a new thing that always punts the savings down, you know, t a decade or l close to a decade, which means we never start saving money. We never start uh, eliminating our deficits and paying down our national debt. Um, but you know, I I would also see. I mean, I would also like to see. A lower corporate tax rate. I would also like to see a simplified uh, personal, you know, personal tax uh, set of policies. Um, but it, it needs to be done in a way that's responsible. That doesn't add to the debt. And by the way, I think part of that, in part of that, um, there needs to be spending reform. And that's something that I used to hear Republicans talk about, but I, I no longer hear them hear them talk about that. Now it's sort of this tax plan that, according to the president, is somehow going to deliver 6% GDP growth, which if he can deliver that, I, that would be incredible. I, I find it extremely hard to believe. There are essentially no experts that say that we can do that. I do believe we've got to get over 2% a year. We've been at or below 2% GDP growth a, a year for a long time. And we can't create the kind of jobs that we need in this country without more than, more than that. And, and I don't believe we can get there without making sure that our economy is highly competitive and, and also, you know, through that competition, inspiring innovation. Mm -hmm. And going back to what you said in the beginning about Stand Up Republic, this was mm -hmm. something that you mm -hmm. co-founded with Mindy Finn, who yeah. I know has mm -hmm. been a GOP digital operative mm -hmm. in D.C. for many, many years. Right. And you also had a chance to work with Congressman Kathy McMorris Rogers. Mm -hmm. And obviously in 2017, we've seen women getting into politics mm -hmm. in all kinds of different arenas, whether it's protests or rallies or uh, running for office. I mean, we've mm -hmm. got young women in office now, like Elise Stefanik in New York. Right. Um, and so kind of looking at women in politics and mm -hmm. urging them to get in, if there's any women who are here at the summit who yeah. are considering you know, getting more active in their communities, whether local or national, what kind of you mm -hmm. know, future do you see for women in politics? Well, I see a bright future because I see a necessity. And I think, um, you know, this last election, this last presidential election, with some of the sort of uh, rhetoric that, that was offensive and even abusive towards women, uh, I think, uh, you know, was a call to the entire country that, that we need more women in leadership. Uh, and I think if, if we have more women in leadership, then, then uh, you know, we're, we'll be headed as a country in a better direction where we never hear that kind of thing from would-be leaders, uh, the, the kinds of, you know, things even, as I say, abusive, um, uh, abusive language towards women and abusive, uh, not, it's not only language, but behavior. Um, but uh, I, I hope that sort of in, in the broader context of this troubled political season that the country is in, 
you know, women and minorities and, and others in our country who haven't as much been a part of sort of the, the, you know, the leadership cadre in our country in Washington, I hope this will be a call to them and really a call to us all to support them in pursuing leadership. And I, I really think that that kind of thing may be the silver lining to some of the challenges in this regard and, and with, with regard to other you know, communities in the United States who may feel marginalized by current leadership. Well, Evan, thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining mm -hmm. us this afternoon, and thank you for speaking mm -hmm. at the Forbes Under 30 Summit. My We're pleasure. Very excited to see mm -hmm. what the future has in store for you, and we'll thank be you. keeping watch. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Thank you guys for tuning in.